Hello, uh, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to Connect Science, a seminar series of the Dana-Farber uh, Harvard Cancer Center. And we have a website where you can see recorded seminars. We've been having a lot of uh, fabulous seminars since I think March of last year on uh, cancer science. And today I'm very pleased uh, to host Trey Westbrook from uh, Baylor College of Medicine. I'm Judy Lieberman and Trey um, is going to give us a talk on RNA splicing in cancer new mechanisms and therapeutic opportunities. Trey um, has been an amazingly productive scientist. He trained um, at the University of Rochester where he got his PhD and then was a postdoc in Steve Elledge's lab here uh, where he uh, did some landmark work, actually the first genome-wide SHRNA screen in uh, mammalian cells to identify um, ge genetic dependencies of, of RAS mutated cancers. Uh, and uh, he developed the barcoding system for DNA, which has enabled all the genome wide um, screens uh, now for CRISPR, et cetera, that, that are done. Uh, since uh, after he was he worked in Steve's lab, he he went to Baylor, where he rapidly rose up the ranks to full professor. And he's uh, he's been the leader of many really important studies published in the highest impact journals, where he's looked at uh, genetic dependencies and synthetic lethality with uh, various key oncogene. Uh, mutations such as for Mick um, in many different cancers. And so I'm very happy to have him uh, present today. Um, if you have questions as they arise, please enter them in the Q&A um, and we'll, we'll get to uh, ask them at the end of the seminar. Trey, it's all yours. Judy, thank you so much uh, for the overly kind uh, introduction. Um, also, a special thank you to Nelly Poyak, uh, David Weinstock, and, and the other organizers of the Connect Science uh, seminar series. I've, I've really enjoyed being a viewer of this series. Certainly, I've learned a lot. Uh, and I'm thrilled to share some of our recent work in RNA splicing uh, and cancer. Uh, these are my disclosures. Now, I'm really privileged to work alongside a great group of, of trainees uh, and collaborators. And so I thought before we get started with the science today, I'd like to point out uh, the colleagues who really led the work. Uh, in particular, uh, some of the initial discoveries that launched our interest uh, in RNA splicing were made years ago by Tiffany Sue, uh, a remarkable physician scientist who's actually there in Boston now at Harvard Med. Uh, and the more recent mechanistic work was led by two all-star students, Elizabeth Bowling and Jerry Wang, uh, with a lot of help from members of our team, Sean Zhang's lab here at Baylor, uh, as well as colleagues in the Therapeutic Innovation Center. Now, for those interested in the details of today's presentation, uh, I would, of course, welcome your questions and ideas. Uh, but if I gloss over any information, um, I would also direct you to these publications um, for specifics. Uh, that describe at least some of the work that we're going to talk about today. Now, over the past decade or so, um, our lab has had a, a growing interest in exploring how many cancers evolve dependencies on the core pathways of RNA metabolism, uh, where some oncogenes or other oncogenic contexts can really drive striking synthetic lethalities with the core molecular machines in each of these steps of RNA processing that I've marked here in blue. Now, certainly um, targeting regulators of transcription and other steps in RNA processing, that's not a new game in cancer therapeutics. Uh, for instance, um, targeting the estrogen receptor uh, and other transcription factors, clearly a, a clinically validated approach. Um, but on, in contrast um, to targeting those kind of specific gene regulatory programs, what I'm referring to here is the surprising realization that many cancers harbor 
unique dependencies on these global engines of RNA metabolism. From core transcriptional CDKs to the spliceosome to the nuclear export complex, et cetera, et cetera. And indeed, there's, there's an entirely new generation of therapeutics um, that are targeting these sort of global processes and are showing remarkable selective activity in preclinical models of cancer. And, and some are, are making their way to the cancer clinic, if not already there. And so now with that said, um, as you might imagine, when we're thinking about targeting such broadly acting pathways, there are some key challenges that are facing the field. For instance, which components or regulators of these molecular machines provide the best therapeutic index? Or which genetic or epigenetic context really make these cancers vulnerable to one or more of these steps in RNA metabolism? Um, and finally, and really importantly, what mechanisms really drive the response and resistance to therapies that, that inhibit these, these cellular processes? Now, while we have interest in, in programs in each of these facets of RNA metabolism, uh, today's talk is really going to focus uh, on our work in one of these areas, uh, and that is our attempt to exploit RNA splicing uh, in cancers driven by the MYC oncogene. And so today's talk um, will be divided into three parts. Uh, I'll start with a very brief introduction as to why we and, and many others uh, in the cancer community are so interested in RNA splicing. And then I'll, I'll summarize the unanticipated discovery that, that MIC drives a very potent synthetic lethality uh, to RNA splicing therapeutics. And finally, uh, I'll describe some of our efforts to understand those mechanisms uh, that led to some surprising connections between splicing and the immune system. Now, I think one of the most surprising clues of the importance of RNA metabolism in cancer uh, actually came from the sequencing of tumor genomes. Um, while the early days of, of tumor virology uh, had given us some hints, uh, I think our eyes were open to, to the importance of RNA splicing in tumor genesis when landmark sequencing studies revealed that core components of splicing uh, and other factors in RNA metabolism are amongst the most frequent somatic mutations in many subtypes of cancer. And this suggested to us and to many in the community uh, that dysregulated RNA metabolism may perhaps be a common hallmark of many, if not all, cancers. Now, many of these original mutations were, were actually localized. Um, hotspot mutations in the spliceosome, uh, like those in the U2 component, SF4B1, that I'm showing you here. And I think this early discovery of these hotspot mutations really led the field to think about targeting these cancers with an oncogene addiction sort of model in mind, uh, really pursuing the idea that these mutated splicing factors lead to splicing alterations in oncogenes and tumor suppressor pathways, and that one could perhaps target these cancers either by inhibiting the mutant splicing factors themselves or by targeting the individual misspliced products uh, that are driving tumorogenesis. But um, in the complex um, transcriptomes of cancer, I think a, a really different picture uh, has been emerging. Um, we know now that aberrations in RNA splicing are, are very much widespread in tumor cells. Uh, with a significant burden of misplicing um, happening as tumors are progressing. Now, shown here is uh, really a representative study from Rob Bradley's team uh, over here on the left, where they've examined splicing in matched normal and tumor samples. Uh, and as you can see, significantly more splicing in tumors as denoted by intron retention in this single gene uh, example. And at the pan transcriptome level, uh, you can see that defective splicing doesn't occur at just a few genes, uh, but is actually occurring across thousands of mRNAs uh, in each tumor. Uh, and this observation and, and observations like it um, has had really two fundamental impacts on how we are thinking about targeting RNA splicing therapeutically. First is that widespread defects in splicing uh, may actually drive tumor genesis by dysregulating not one, but many oncogenes and tumor suppressors, um, often in combination and in heterogeneous ways. Um, and that uh, could make it challenging to, um, to think about how to select individual misspliced events uh, to target therapeutically with, again, an oncogene addiction type of approach. 
But the second, and as you'll, as you'll see in, in the talk today, uh, we and others have observed that accumulation of misspliced RNA itself can in some contexts create or prime stresses um, that are selective to or maybe enhanced in cancer cells. Um, and much like the, the stress response paradigms for other macromolecules, like the DNA damage response or the unfolded protein response, <clears throat> our goal is really to learn the mechanisms by which these misprocessed RNAs are contributing to cancer stress, uh, and then try to exploit that information uh, therapeutically. So with that backdrop in mind, uh, I'm going to briefly summarize some of our early discoveries and the role of MYC as um, really one of these oncogenic contexts that drives a dependency on splicing. One, I think, of, of, of many. Uh, and, then I'll, and then we'll spend the bulk of our time together um, talking about it, our effort to understand therapeutics that target splicing. And specifically, we've uncovered uh, really a surprising observation that misspliced RNAs in tumor cells may themselves be a trigger for the antiviral innate immune system in some context. Okay, so how did a, uh, I guess as Judy described, a self-proclaimed geneticist uh, get dragged into studying um, RNA biology? Uh, well, this story uh, really begins with our interest in, in targeting the, um, the oncogenic transcription factor, MYC. Now, MYC is oncogene certainly well known to many of you, so I'm not going to belabor much of an introduction here. Uh, we chose to tackle the problem of MYC-driven cancers for a few reasons. First, um, and importantly, MYC is one of the most common drivers of triple negative breast cancer, which is a disease focus for our team. Uh, and secondly, um, MYC, like many classic oncogenes, has a sort of dual nature, um, like uh, has been well described for KRAS and other oncogenes. It elicits both pro-tumorigenic and anti-tumorigenic pathways, uh, sometimes collectively referred to as uh, oncogenic stress. Now, our general strategy has been to search out the mechanisms that exacerbate this type of oncogenic stress uh, by leveraging unbiased genetic approaches like the ones Judy described at the beginning. Now, as a, as a complement to the really beautiful CRISPR and RNAi screening compendia in DepMap, Project Drive, and many others uh, that have really propelled the community, um, our approach is a much more reductionist one, um, essentially applying synthetic lethal screens in isogenic normal cell systems. Now, in this case, we're, we're engineering normal memory epithelial cells uh, with an inducible MYC allele, um, and then screening for genes that are selectively required when MYC is apparently activated. Now, we've conducted several generations of these uh, synthetic lethal screens with large libraries of uh, first shRNAs and now CRISPR libraries, um, and then use standard enrichment and network-based approaches to ask what are really the underlying pathways or processes or mechanisms that are most important points uh, of stress upon MYC hyperactivation. And really, as one of the most remarkable and reproducible observations is that uh, many core steps in RNA metabolism represent nodes of synthetic lethality with MYC. And these include um, RNA splicing, ribosomal RNA processing, and RNA degradation. And what I'm showing you up here is really just an enrichment of uh, one of our many synthetic lethal screens with MYC or excuse me, enrichment analysis. And this observation has really changed our view of how MYC uh, could be rewiring gene expression and creating new vulnerabilities uh, in cancer. Now, for the, the remainder of our time together, um, we're going to focus on this top complex here in the enrichment analysis of uh, the human spliceosome. Now, as you well know, um, spliceosome is a macromolecular machine. Uh, with more than 130 proteins assembling and disassembling on every exon intron junction of every pre mRNA molecule. Now, from a, a drug discovery perspective and thinking about therapeutics of cancer, uh, we've been really drawn to the fact that there are at least 19 enzymes um, and hundreds of regulatory factors. And we've spent a number of years now exploring uh, many of these enzymes as candidates for uh, deep target validation and drug discovery. And I'm showing you here on the right uh, just one representative data for, uh, in this case, SA3B1. Uh, 
which as you know is a, a core component of the spliceosome involved in three prime splice site selection. Uh, and of course is a, a notoriously uh, frequently mutated oncogene in several blood cancers, um, as well as melanoma and breast cancer. And as you can see here, a depletion with SH on top or chemical degradation with DTAC systems on bottom of SF3B1 results in a really catastrophic cell death when MYC is hyperactive in this isogenic cell system. Uh, really, I think, clearly telling us that SF3B1 is indeed MYC synthetic lethal. And we've confirmed this now for um, dozens of components of the spliceosome. Uh, and this has really emphasized to us that there's something very special about core RNA splicing and how cells tolerate MYC. Um, and that's a point we'll return to um, in, in just a minute. Now, given this MYC synthetic lethality, I think the next obvious question is, um, do we see such uh, selective dependencies in MYC-driven cancer models? Again, that's an isogenic system, but artificial in nature. And so uh, does, is this really happening in cancer models? Uh, and indeed we do. Um, shown here is, is actually a pan-cancer analysis of close to 400 cancer cell lines uh, from uh, DepMap and Project Drive, uh, where we rank ordered the codependency score of all genes against make dependency from left to right. Uh, and here we've marked components of the spliceosome and its regulators uh, with uh, these red vertical lines. Uh, and I think what's clear from this pattern is that many, but not all, of these spliceosome components exhibit a really significantly high dependency uh, or correlative dependency in MYC-dependent models. And this is something that we've seen again and again uh, in orthogonal data sets across other large screening compendia uh, and in testing uh, individual cancer cell models. So um, based on these and, um, and other observations, we think that the spliceosome and its regulation uh, is an exciting target space for TNBC and other cancers driven by me. Uh, and I would point you to uh, a wealth of literature, uh, both ours and others that have now um, validated this synthetic lethal interaction. Now, of course, um, the splicing aficionados in the audience will, will already know that there's a, a, a rich, a 20 year history of chemical biology um, in this space um, that um, we're sort of loosely referring to here as spliceosome targeted therapies or STTs for the rest of the talk. Now, while there are um, several exciting classes of these STTs, uh, much of the focus has um, historically been on SA3 one modulators shown here uh, over on the left with several different natural products uh, semi-synthetics and fully synthetics now, and distinct pharmacophores that all target SA3B1 and its interactions. But um, I think it's fair to say that one of the biggest obstacles in this space uh, or in exploiting STTs has been the lack of information about which drivers or other uh, tumor context or characteristics are really governing sensitivity to these STTs. And so consistent with the genetic data, the um, We've found that several um, structurally distinct modulators of SA3B1, uh, but not all, um, exert very potent mixed synthetic lethality uh, in isogenic systems, again, corroborating the genetic results shown you over here on the left. Um, and are also, um, these molecules are very potent against MYC positive uh, TNBC uh, models uh, relative to normal uh, malignant cell types. But based on uh, these types of observations and, and others like it, uh, we've begun to explore uh, really the preclinical activity of SA3B1 modulators and other STTs in MYC driven triple negative breast cancer. Now, as a reminder, um, TMBC is, is really one of the most aggressive subtypes of breast cancer. Um, it's a terrible disease, frankly. Um, and in contrast to other subtypes, um, despite a lot of effort by the community to identify targeted therapy solutions, um, the standard of care for um, primary TMBC, at least, remains surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. And many of you may know that um, at least two immunotherapy agents have recently been approved for metastatic TMBC, uh, although I think it's worth mentioning that these modalities have not shown the uh, the sort of remarkable effects that, uh, have been observed in other cancers like melanoma. And that's an important point uh, we'll return to later in the talk. Uh, 
And notably, um, MIC is uh, one of the most prominent lesions, one of the most prominent drivers observed in resistant uh, TMBCs. Um, and so we're now uh, evaluating whether STTs alone or in combination um, are effective in um, MIC amplified uh, disease settings. Now for our preclinical programs, we've been really fortunate to have uh, long time collaborations uh, with Mike Lewis uh, and Matthew Ellis at Baylor. Uh, who, along with a lot of WELM, have developed a really uh, beautiful repository of proteogenomically characterized PDX models from TNBC patients. Um, with many of these models actually having matched primary uh, or proteogenomic information on primary or their metastatic lesions. And so in the context of this cohort, uh, we've begun evaluating um, STTs and really have been uh, focused the lion's share of our efforts on um, the H3 biomedicine molecule 8800. Now, while uh, these studies are early, um, we are observing really remarkable single agent activity in some MIC amplified chemorefractory models, like the one sh I'm showing you here on top. Um, again, this is uh, pretty early days, but uh, spurred by these observations, we're very interested in testing whether MIC is a correlate. Um, perhaps even a biomarker uh, of response to STTs. Um, and I think more broadly, we're, we're um, currently leveraging the power of this very well-characterized cohort to try to identify what other drivers or other oncogenic contexts might create similar vulnerabilities to these splicing-based uh, therapeutics. But I think um, the question that has most intrigued us uh, is, is how does the therapeutic index from these STTs arise? Um, if I was to put that another way, um, what are the basic mechanisms and pathways uh, by which these STTs lead to tumor cell death? Uh, and can we actually use that information to generate new therapeutic hypotheses and perhaps even combination therapies? Now, for the remainder of our time together, uh, I'm going to share with you um, a really unusual mechanism that connects uh, the mechanism of action of these STTs with activation uh, of antiviral immune signaling. Okay, so what's the model here uh, for how STTs may kill MIC-driven cancers? Uh, well, for that, we need a, a little bit of context on MIC biology. Um, many of you may, may know that MIC has... Um, really long been described to increase rates of protein translation. But what has become uh, strikingly apparent over the past decade or so is that oncogenic MIC also increases global RNA synthesis. Um, and I think what's key here, and what I'd really like to emphasize, is that MIC turns up pre-mRNA synthesis not at a few target genes, uh, but directly or indirectly, um, it turns up total cellular pre-mRNA production. And so the simple working model that we've proposed is um, such MIC-induced global increases in these nascent pre-mRNA pools adds a significant burden to the endogenous capacity of the spliceosome, um, essentially um, making the spliceosome rate limiting like beautiful studies uh, from Manuel Aries. Now in this context, um, even modest perturbation of the spliceosome uh, may lead to widespread errors in RNA processing. Um, and so a, a really key question uh, to address and one that we're going to focus on for the next few slides is the how. How do cancer cells sense and how do they respond to such rampant uh, accumulation of misplaced RNA? Now, while, while clearly um, misplaced RNA can, can cause an imbalance in the expression and the stoichiometries of, of many proteins, uh, over the next few slides, I'll, I'm going to provide some data that supports an alternative uh, hypothesis. Namely, that these misspliced RNAs themselves are triggers for tumor cell death. And that they're, they're doing this by activating the antiviral pathways that, that normally detect double-stranded RNA viruses, a process that um, some refer to as uh, viral mimicry. Now, this is true. Uh, this model has some really important implications for how we use STTs, uh, but also how we can possibly trigger anti-tumor immunity in some unanticipated ways. Okay, so how do we uh, get to this unusual hypothesis? Well, really, it was through um, two uh, orthogonal, um, independent approaches 
uh, that honed in on the same answer. Uh, first, we, we simply look for conserved gene expression changes uh, in response to STTs across multiple TNBC cell lines. Um, and some examples are shown over here on the left. And the GSEA uh, revealed really a striking pattern that nearly all of the positively enriched pathways uh, were in double-stranded RNA sensing, interferon signaling, uh, and downstream antiviral transcriptional programs. Uh, and indeed, if, if one drills down into those uh, gene sets, those, um, those transcriptional signatures, it's pretty clear that SCTs are activating an interferon response and other uh, proxies of innate immune antiviral signaling. Now, this data uh, suggested to us that SCTs are, are potent inducers of double-stranded RNA sensing uh, and antiviral pathways in cancer cells. But do those pathways, are they just um, sort of um, bystanders or are they actually contributing to cancer cell death? And here we got a clue from a second uh, unbiased approach where we leverage genetic screens, um, which of course are our core expertise in our lab. And here the idea is very simple. We're just doing resistance screens, in this case, SHRNA screens, uh, looking for um, factors whose depletion contributes to resistance to STTs like um, SD6 or AD800. Now, remarkably, um, five of the, let's say about top 12, 10 or 12 of the hits from these SH screens were components uh, of the double-stranded RNA sensing and signal transduction pathways. And when one does um, unbiased network analysis, uh, one of the clear hubs we find is immunity. And if one actually drills into the, the gene list of this hub, uh, we're clearly pulling out uh, antiviral signaling. Now we've uh, validated this observation with um, many different independent approaches, SH, SGs, uh, and pharmacologic approaches. Shown here is actually just an example um, uh, of one such experiment where uh, CRISPR-based deletion of one of these antiviral pathway components, RNF-128, uh, clearly confers resistance to STT in, in triple negative breast cancer cells. Now this um, and other data led us to the, I think, pretty interesting idea that SCTs may kill cancers in part by stimulating antiviral double-stranded RNA signaling. Now just to zoom out a bit, um, as this audience knows well, there's a lot of excitement uh, in the field to stimulate uh, what many are calling viral mimicry, to inflame tumors with immunologically cold microenvironments. Now, as you know, um, this process of, of viral mimicry um, really involves the activation of pattern recognition receptors that uh, typically recognize uh, either double-stranded RNA or double-stranded DNA viruses. And many studies have now shown that this process uh, can be activated in tumors with either um, exogenous ligands, uh, nucleic acid ligands, or a whole host of different strategies uh, to induce accumulation of endogenous double-stranded DNA or endogenous double-stranded RNA uh, in tumor cells. And I've, um, just for your reference, listed a few of those examples over here on the left. Now, with this context in mind, um, the data I just showed you, I think, provokes the following mechanistic hypothesis. Uh, that SCTs actually trigger cancer cell intrinsic antiviral signaling, um, perhaps through accumulation of misspliced RNA and double-stranded RNA sensing mechanisms. Um, and that it perhaps it's these an ancient antiviral pathways that may be a mechanism, perhaps a conserved mechanism of cancer cell death that's elicited by splicing inhibition. Now, if correct, I think this model has some obvious implications uh, for how we might leverage STTs. But, but before we get there, um, I'd like to walk you through um, just a few of the core tenets of this model um, and some of the predictions, uh, because I think it helps to flesh out uh, some of the ideas. Now, first, this model really um, suggests that splicing perturbation not only leads to accumulation of misspliced RNA, but Importantly, these aberrant RNAs are escaping quality control mechanisms in the nucleus and accumulating in the cytoplasm. And this prediction is really critical to the model since, as you know, double-stranded RNA sensors are actually localized in the cytoplasm. And indeed, as you can see over here on the left, 
qPCR of cytoplasmic RNA uh, reveals that misplaced RNAs after STT treatment um, are, are very much enriched in the cytoplasm. And actually, RNA-seq of these same cytoplasmic fractions um, shown here in the ECDF plot um, clearly show us that um, accumulation of intron-retained RNAs is happening across the transcriptome of these tumor cells. And to confirm that these uh, fractionation approaches uh, weren't misleading us, we've also used a number of orthogonal approaches. And here we're, we're showing you single molecule approaches like RNA fish. Um, and I think you can see that in this example, there's um, clearly misspliced messages making their way to the cytoplasm after spliceosome inhibition. Now, a second critical prediction of this model um, is that these misspliced messages are actually forming double stranded RNA structures. Because of course, it's those double-stranded RNAs that are the potential triggers for antiviral sensors in the cytoplasm. So to begin exploring that hypothesis, um, we've leveraged immunofluorescent approaches uh, with antibodies that specifically recognize um, not proteins, but double-stranded RNA structures. Now we've used several uh, different antibodies, uh, including the J2 antibody I'm showing you here, um, that recognizes stretches of, uh, I believe it's 40 plus base, pair, uh, base pairing of double-stranded RNA. Um, and as one can see here, um, splicing perturbation leads to a really significant accumulation of double-stranded RNA in the cytoplasm of these TMBC cells. Um, and that's quantified over here on the right. Now we've seen this effect across um, multiple MYC amplified cancer cell lines. Uh, but strikingly less so, uh, or sometimes not at all in normal cell types, consistent with this, this selective cell death that's being induced by these agents. Now we know this is not, or we know that this is an on-target effect because a point mutation of SA3B1 can completely rescue uh, this phenomena, uh, suggesting it really is on-target engagement. Um, but to take that a step further, to, we wanted to discern whether this is something unique or something unusual about these inhibitors. Uh, and their mode of action, or whether this is something uh, maybe more generalized. And so we've used protac-like approaches uh, with the now uh, well-described DTAC system. Um, and we're using these approaches to selectively degrade, uh, in this case, SA3B1, but we've done this across many components of the spliceosome. And as you can see here, we observe a, a very nice dose-dependent uh, degradation and killing of TMB cells when we uh, degrade SA3B1. And this tracks really nicely with strong double-stranded RNA accumulation uh, when SA3B1 is partially degraded. Now I'm going to pause here for just a moment uh, because I think this, the implication here is, is important for, uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, these data really suggest that misspliced endogenous RNA, or some fraction of it, uh, is forming double-stranded RNAs that accumulate in the cytoplasm and activate double-stranded RNA antiviral signaling. Now, based on this hypothesis, we've become really interested in um, what kind of pools of endogenous RNAs in tumor cells may be accumulating, maybe folding, um, and perhaps driving this antiviral signal. Now, um, we're very much early days here, but uh, we've just begun to explore um, what are those double-stranded RNA pools. Uh, and I'm going to show you um, just a couple pieces of data that illustrate um, our thinking and, and where we're headed. Here we're looking at um, RNA-seq of, again, cytoplasmic RNA after TMBCs were treated with the SCT8800 um, and honing in specifically on mapping repetitive elements like endogenous lines and signs, which are either known or predicted to form double-stranded RNA structures. And as you can see in these CD ECDFs, there's really widespread increase in intron-residing repetitive elements, but not in the repetitive elements in the corresponding intergenic regions of these um, line and sign elements. And that's important because there's certainly been a lot of excitement in the past few years in how some epigenetic drugs like DNMT inhibitors may induce anti-tumor inflammation through intergenic repetitive elements. And so our data is um, at least suggesting that SCTs may be inducing a novel class of these repetitive elements that are residing in introns and thus open up perhaps new angles for how we might exploit uh, this information in biomimicry uh, at large. So to begin drilling down on that a bit further, 
uh, we've adapted the double-stranded RNA binding J2 antibody for a RIP-seq type of approach. Now, using this type of sequencing approach, we've um, begun to identify uh, specifically which classes of intronic elements are robustly induced by SDTs and form double-stranded RNA structures. And ultimately, our hope is to leverage this type of data uh, along with other types of um, in situ RNA folding um, and sequencing approaches like, uh, um, like shape and other, and other approaches uh, to really appreciate what are the structures and ligands for these double-stranded RNA sensors. And ultimately, that's, that's one of our goals is to really figure out which RNAs are loading onto these sensors and triggering antiviral pathways. Now, as the, as the immunologists in the room know well, um, I'm certainly not an immunologist, uh, but there are many of these double-stranded RNA viral sensors in the human proteome. Um, and so we're also working on methods to directly map which RNAs load onto these sensors using eClip uh, with our colleague Eric Van Nostrand uh, and other approaches. And we're doing that in the context uh, of splicing perturbations. Now, activation of these pathways, uh, these double-stranded RNA sensing pathways, can lead to some, uh, some hallmark features. Um, and I've just listed a few of those here, uh, like extrinsic apoptosis, uh, interferon signaling, and other inflammatory transcriptional responses. Um, and sometimes uh, they also lead to downstream recruitment of cellular immunity, and we'll get back to that point in just a minute. Uh, and so we, we've um, done a fair bit of um, a deep dive into looking at the effects of STTs on these various outputs uh, of antiviral signaling. And I'm just going to highlight just a couple of points here. Indeed, we, um, we see actually pretty much all of the telltale signs uh, of DSRNA sensing, including aggregation of the signal transduction transducer MAVs, shown here on top. Uh, we see induction of transcriptional programs that uh, really look like double-stranded RNA sensing, including interferon and IRF responses, shown here in this GSCA plot, uh, as well as downstream cytokines and chemokine expression. In addition, um, I think it's worth noting that we also see a very strong activation of extrinsic apoptosis, uh, typified by a caspase-8 dependent cell death, shown here on the bottom. Now, collectively, these and other data have told us that SCTs are um, pretty potent uh, inducers of cancer cell intrinsic antiviral signaling and cell death. Um, now, in line with that hypothesis, um, I think that there's um, a number of different avenues we're really trying to investigate the mechanism, but I think one obvious area and one um, downstream consequence that we're very interested in is the implications for downstream adaptive responses that might be elicited by these agents. Now, I'm going to end uh, with the last couple of data slides with some preliminary studies where we've begun to investigate this hypothesis uh, that SCTs may prime or stimulate an adaptive response by first uh, starting this sort of inf antiviral inflammatory uh, signaling. Now, Beginning to explore this uh, possibility, we started by really profiling the response of several immune competent gem models to STTs like 8800. Here I'm showing you four models uh, that we've profiled in collaboration with Sean Zeng's lab. And as you can see here from these four panels, uh, there's a fair bit of heterogeneity in the efficacy of 8800 in these models, uh, with some uh, very sensitive models uh, and some uh, uh, seemingly uh, fairly resistant. And I think what's intriguing here is that the sensitive models also exhibit activation of targets of the antiviral double-stranded RNA response, but resistant models do not. Now, if one um, zooms out and takes a, a more meta view of this data uh, and does GSCA for distinctions between the sensitive and resistant gem models, uh, something really striking emerges. Uh, shown here is clustering um, not of genes, but of gene signatures. Uh, where each column is a tumor model and each row is a gene signature uh, that is essentially the response or the delta for induction by STTs. And I'll draw your attention here to this cluster uh, that is up exclusively in the sensitive models. 
And what's notable is that um, these gene expression signatures that are separating sensitive from resistant models are almost exclusively immune signatures. Um, and those include innate antiviral signaling, as well as production of chemoattractants and adaptive immune cells. And this really raises um, the intriguing possibility that spliceosome perturbations may be leading to not only activation of cellular in, or intrinsic cellular antiviral signaling, but also perhaps uh, adaptive cellular immunity. Um, now, while this is preliminary data, I think that's we're, we're already seeing some of the some of the features that would uh, be consistent with that hypothesis. Shown here is just one of the two sensitive gems stained for CD8 positive. Um, and from this, as well as flow cytometry, you can see that 8800 is clearly inducing CD8 T cell infiltration into these tumors. Um, and while this data is preliminary, we are very interested in exploring how STTs uh, may be used as stimulators of anti tumor immunity in various disease settings. Now, this is uh, in mouse models. Uh, what about in patients? Um, well, the short answer is that it's uh, too early to know. Um, as these SCTs are just in the early stages of clinical development. Uh, but one provocative implication or question that this discovery has led us to ask is whether there's evidence of such communication between RNA misplicing and perhaps immune signaling in breast cancer, perhaps even in the absence of SCTs. In other words, um, is endogenous misplicing or misprocessing of RNA uh, which, as I've already highlighted, is a common feature in many cancers, is that perhaps a trigger for immune engagement during tumor evolution? Now, I'm going to end uh, this story in our talk today with uh, one really just tantalizing, very preliminary piece of data, where we've explored the RNA-seq data from TCGA uh, breast cancer cohort, but in a unique way. First, we've calculated the intron retention in these tumors as a proxy for misplicing, and we've done that across all tumors. And then we've asked uh, what pathways correlate with high levels of RNA misplicing in tumors, um, as shown over here on the right. Now, quite strikingly, um, we, we observe that many cellular compartments of the immune system uh, are very strong correlates with uh, intron retention and misplicing. And I should make a, a side note here that uh, that's independent of tumor mutational burden, which of course is a well-known uh, well correlate of immune infiltration. And this suggests that intron retention and the splicing may be an independent factor contributing to immune engagement uh, during tumor evolution. Moreover, um, it's worth noting that patients with cancers that have high levels of intron retention, so more misplicing, also have better disease-free survival. Um, consistent with the idea that such immune engagement may actually be participating uh, in tumor control. And this is uh, certainly an early result, uh, but provokes the idea that perhaps throughout the genesis of cancer uh, and its evolution and progression, certain types of RNA misplicing may be signaling to the immune system uh, through some of the mechanisms we're just starting to discover. Now, we're actively uh, pursuing that hypothesis, um, and I think all the surrounding rules of engagement um, with the ultimate goal of trying to leverage STTs as perhaps even immune-based uh, combination therapies. Now, in the interest of time, um, I'm not gonna try to recap the model here, um, which you can see in, in this slide, uh, but rather uh, I'll leave you with just a few forward-looking directions. Um, first, I, I've shown you that some STTs, uh, like 8800, can activate antiviral signaling in the context of MYC-driven cancers. But it's very much an, an open question as to which spices and perturbations really best stimulate these pathways and unveil anti tumor efficacy. It's worth noting that we've already started to observe that there can be dramatic differences in the activation of these pathways by targeting either different spices and components or by using chemical probes against the same target, but that have different mechanisms of action, telling us that there will be perhaps some rules to how misplicing can speak to antiviral signaling. Um, and perhaps even some opportunities to manipulate uh, those scenarios. Now, second, we're very interested in both the types of endogenous RNAs and which double-stranded RNA sensors uh, are actually engaging those RNA pools, uh, because we think there's a lot of opportunity here to understand how to exploit those pathways 
and how maybe even in patients to predict mechanisms of resistance to drugs that target RNA splicing and other forms of RNA processing. And finally, um, we're, we're very early days, but intrigued by the idea uh, that one might be able to exploit the differences in RNA splicing between normal and malignant states in a way that can activate anti-tumor immunity. And so we're very interested in and welcome um, collaborations uh, to delineate those rules of engagement and trying to figure out what compartments of the immune system really pay a, a pivotal role uh, in response to STTs. And lastly, um, we're very interested in, can we learn how to combine STTs uh, with immune modulating therapeutics uh, for rational combination approaches? Now, thankfully, um, uh, I'll end the science there, but uh, we're, we're, we're very grateful not to be trying to answer these questions alone. Um, uh, really excited to be part of a broader RNA and growing RNA community at Baylor. Um, so before we end today, I'd just like to thank uh, the colleagues you see here on the screen for their ideas and collaboration. Um, about three years ago, uh, recognizing how important and how much impact RNA is having on health and disease, um, Baylor actually started a, a new center dedicated to, to bringing it together uh, both academic scientists studying RNA as well as scientists driving early therapeutic discovery. Uh, this community makes it a lot of fun to do science and, and we're an actively growing community as well. Um, now with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention uh, and I'd certainly uh, welcome any questions. Thank you, Trey, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we have a bunch of questions, but I'm gonna take my prerogative as chair to ask you one. I, I was wondering, have you compared um, hematologic malignancies to solid tumors in, in terms of the importance of this, of double-stranded RNA pathways? And one of the reasons I'm asking is that recently um, there are some, there's at least one in inflammasome that recognizes cytosolic double-stranded RNA and would be likely to trigger uh, inflammation, which I think is more immunogenic than interferons. Um, and so that's, and those inflammasomes are more likely to be in, in uh, hematopoietic uh, cancers. So, so that's why I asked. Yeah, that's a great question, Judy. Um, uh, so full disclosure, I think we're early days, so I, I wouldn't make any definitive statements. Um, you know, I'm sure you're aware um, Omar Abdel Wahab and others have some really interesting data that uh, in some uh, blood cancers, uh, there might actually be more uh, specific misplacing events that could contribute to, to some of that, um, um, let's say, uh, uh, general inflammatory signaling. Um, but I think the, uh, the, one of the, the most challenging aspects here is to sort out what are the sort of evolutionary correlates in these cancers and what is actually happening. So we got lucky here, frankly, because we were perturbing the system with a very dramatic perturbation in RNA splicing. Um, and that's how, we, um, that's how we picked it up. Um, I would say that um, it's, it's important to note that these RNA splicing or misplicing to inflammation and other things that may not always be a uh, anti-cancer type of signaling scenario, right? It could be that in some situations, those are speaking to infl inflammatory mechanisms that are actually proteinergenic. Um, and I think, again, we're, we're really early days in trying to figure that out. Um, so I know that's not a very satisfying answer, but I don't really have a, uh, there's not concrete evidence that it's more or less important in these, in these different malignancies. Okay, Let, let's go to the audience. So Jenny, Je, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, asked, even though knockdown of SF3B1 in the paired normal cell lines didn't seem to induce cell death, will inhibition of splicing complex be tolerated systemically? And does this consideration go into your choice of an ideal target within the complex? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. And I think actually, uh, that question or the spirit of that question um, sort of held back the field for quite some time because I think that the immediate gut check response to targeting the spliceosome or any, targeting any other um, you know, core cellular machine in, our, in, you know, in gene regulation, um, I, th I think that that's, there's an obvious opportunity for toxicity and tolerability concerns. Um, 
But actually, uh, we see a pretty significant therapeutic window. You saw in the preclinical studies, uh, those uh, mice tolerate these um, systemically uh, delivered uh, agents pretty well. Um, 8800 is one of the molecules that's um, in the clinic right now. I think it's still a little too early, although it has shown a favorable tolerability profile. Um, there are other molecules that didn't do as well, and I think a lot of that's going to be about mechanism of action of how we inhibit splicing. Um, and if we do careful studies to really figure out um, uh, what is the source of that therapeutic index. So um, again, I, I think that um, like many of the core uh, gene regulatory uh, mechanisms, you know, there are some interesting ways to, to thread the therapeutic index. Great. Um, Bruno Amati asks, is activation... Oh, hi. Uh, is activation of NMD, nonsense mediated decay, involved in the response to uh, these splicing inhibitors? Yeah, uh, that's a great, uh, great question, Bruno. And I know Bruno has himself some, some work in this territory. Um, we personally don't know. Uh, we anticipated, we were actually quite surprised uh, that these misspliced RNAs would be accumulating at any levels in the cytoplasm. I think we initially anticipated they would be degraded by quality control in the nucleus, especially, but also in the cytoplasm. Um, now we're actually very interested in whether or not we can manipulate different ribonuclease QC programs in the cytoplasm to elevate these sort of inflammatory triggers. Um, but again, before we do that, we have to figure out what kind of RNAs are really responsible for triggering these responses. Um, but Bruno, thank you for the question. I think it's a good one. Okay, let's, we have loads of questions. That's always a good sign. Um, Antonis Karamilas asks, do STTs induce the integrated stress response and induce EIF2 alpha phosphorylation through activation of PKR? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, another great question. Um, we looked pretty hard at the integrated stress response um, uh, in, in other pathways like it. Um, and we did see, I would say, hints, but it wasn't an overwhelming signal um, like you would see with other stimuli known to induce that response. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for variation there. Uh, that context is probably going to matter. Um, what other oncogenic insults or what other um, baseline um, levels of the, that signaling pathway are already present in the tumor. Okay, so Shanka Sapathy asks, have you systematically looked at sensors that bind these accumulated double standard RNAs in a wide variety of cancer cells or gem models? And would you anticipate that the landscape might be cancer specific or even heterogeneous within specific cancer subtypes? Also, is there a way to enrich um, these double stranded RNAs in a native Lysis setting, I guess, with J2 or, but anyway, you answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, Shanka, it's uh, a great question. Um, so uh, the short answer is we don't know, but we suspect that there is going to be a lot of heterogeneity, not just across the genetic backgrounds of cancers, but even across tissues and how they're wired to detect or not these types of misprocessed RNAs. Um, and so I don't think there's gonna be one catch-all answer. I think that there will be variation across different cell types and, and different genetic backgrounds. Um, the second question was about, are there ways to enrich or look at? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the yeah, last question. Yeah, capture the uh, RNAs that are- Yeah, yeah so, we're, yeah, so we're taking a sort of a integrated approach where using J2 and things like it to try to capture double-stranded RNAs out of different um, backgrounds and different tissues, but also using eClip and, and, and other methods to find like what's actually loaded on the sensors. Um, and then uh, finally, we're very interested in um, sort of in situ fold, RNA folding methods uh, where you use different types of uh, uh, chemical sequencing based approaches to, to figure that out. We're very interested in all of those questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, so Xu Feng Zhou asks, is it possible that these double-stranded RNAs come from endogenous retroviruses? Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so uh, that's actually one of the earliest observations that we got excited about because there's clearly a lot of great 
uh, data and a lot of great labs working on how epigenetic drugs, which of course can unleash intergenic uh, repetitive elements, ERVs, et cetera. Um, and so when we realized that a lot of these intron residing ERVs were there, uh, we think that there are very natural um, can set of candidates for these um, pools that are uh, lighting up dsRNA sensors. We haven't proven that yet, uh, but we're very excited about that about that idea. Yeah, a related question from Alan Herbert is how does um, response to STT correlate with ADAR expression? Uh, yeah, there's a that's a great question. Um, there's been some really cool work. Um, I'm I'm sure that the the what's driving that question is that as many people know, um, ADAR. Uh, modifies RNA to sometimes prevent or mitigate RNA folding. Um, and so some studies have shown that ADAR inhibition can actually lead to more RNA folding and maybe activation of some of these same pathways. Um, so, and that's a, there's some really beautiful stories behind that. Um, we don't yet know how well, like if the same tumor models are always sensitive to ADAR perturbation and STTs, um, certainly it makes sense, uh, but I would, um, I would have some caution about that because it's uh, there are some assumptions that we don't know whether ADAR modified RNAs are the same pools that are lighting up uh, these sensors that are maybe expressed or accumulating when we when we inhibit the lysosome. So that's to be determined. Okay, uh, moving on. William Beck, wonderful talk. Thank you. He asked this, what he says is a somewhat naive question. Could um, the STTs be working on MIC driven tumors because MIC undergoes ex extensive splicing? And would you see the same immune effects if you block a gene that has only one or two um, splicing variants? And what about SFs that impact MIC like PTBP1? Uh, yeah, that's a, a great question. And I hope. Um... Uh, in the context of this presentation, um, I think that those are two very complementary ideas. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think one is necessarily right or the other. Um, there are going to be some situations where it really is about misplicing of a few events uh, that drive some of the disease uh, pathogenesis. Um, in our case, at least in the isogenic systems, I don't think that misplicing of MYC is going to explain the phenotypes, at least the isogenic screening systems, because in there, the MYC ER is not spliced at all. Um, and so you can't explain it that way. Um, but certainly there uh, is opportunity for, in some context, misplacing of MIC to play a role. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Josh Young asks, intron retention events are thought to be important for myeloid development. Are there any impact on the immune development caused by the STT drugs? Oh, uh, thank you for asking that question, Josh. And, I, and something I should have alluded to but didn't in the talk, um, there's clearly uh, some really important data describing how um, some intron retention uh, is actually developmentally programmed. So there are certain signaling situations or certain cellular context uh, where intron retention is happening as part of normal gene regulation. Um, the type of intron retention that, that we've been observing and describing is, is much more pervasive and let's say pan transcriptome than that. Um, but certainly I, I take your I take the question. Um, we don't actually know what the immune immunologic effects are of splicing perturbations. In particular, we're we're very interested in whether or not as we're in eliciting uh, perhaps an inflammatory and um, and in an immune stimulating environment in the tumor, we like to know whether STTs are positively or negatively affecting immune cells as they try to enter in uh, and do their business in tumors. So um, certainly there's a lot left to learn there and we're trying to create some genetic models to answer those questions. I, I'm just curious, have you looked at uh, the numbers of infiltrating T cells in, I, I, you showed one slide, but in, in some, context, high interferons might uh, cause killing of uh, lymph T, T cells. So I'm curious if you've looked at all. Yeah, we haven't looked at that yet, Judy, but um, maybe offline, I think I have a number of uh, questions for you and maybe we could uh, start <laughs> some ideas and some collaborations too. 
Sounds great. I'm very interested in this. Okay, so uh, uh, a question from Mariela Cortez Lopez. Uh, she said that given that ADAR enzymes are implicated in the double strand RNA uh, response, are there any alterations of ADAR in triple negative breast cancer that alter its function um, with splicing disruption? Uh, yeah, I like that question a lot. Uh, the, to my knowledge, uh, I'm not aware of somatic mutations or other in ADAR uh, that would um, point to that. Uh, I know that Rob McDonald at Novartis um, and some other colleagues have had some really interesting observations that some TNBCs are very sensitive to uh, ADAR1 perturbations and, and even chemical perturbations, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure we know yet definitively what are the underlying mechanisms for that. Um, this general idea, I think, is, a, is an interesting one, but I don't, I'm not sure we understand what are the underlying culprits. Great. And one last question we have time for is uh, STD. Uh, uh, if, wait. The, 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 Hai Tao Wang asks, uh, would treatment of tumor cells with double-stranded RNA be a better strategy to kill them than STTs? And have you seen um, some double-stranded RNA producing regulators that are enriched in the mixed synthetic screen? Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so uh, the first question was about delivery of exogenous double-stranded RNAs is what I heard. Is that right, Judy? Yeah, what, what it, therapeutically, what if you um, transfects, had a way of delivering double-stranded RNA into the cytoplasm, would that? Yeah, uh, yeah, that? yeah thank you. Uh, thank you for clarifying. Uh, there's clearly um, uh, plenty of uh, good science happening right now trying to learn how to deliver different nucleic acid ligands to stimulate these pathways. So I, I think that's a, a great approach. Um, the delivery can sometimes be an issue, um, but uh, I would also just uh, maybe qualify a bit of how splicing or SCTs are working in mate driven cancers. We found this really interesting, or to us, really interesting uh, uh, mechanism that describes how they, how they may work in stimulating antiviral signaling, but we haven't proven that's all they do. And so there might be other aspects or facets of the synthetic lethality that are not explained by that, uh, that could still be engaged or being used in SCTs. So um, yeah, so I think to be continued. Actually, there's one last question I missed um, from Sally Church. And she said, have you looked at H3B8800 in MIC-driven uh, pancreatic cancer? And does it have any immunogenic effect? We have not, we have not, but we would support and encourage anyone who wants to try. <laughs> okay, well, this was an amazing seminar and set of uh, discussion, I think, about uh, your, your work and it, it's very pr provocative and I really thank you for sharing it with us today. Judy, thank you for hosting. I definitely wanna thank the Connect Series team again and uh, also, everyone who's online today, thank you for your attention and for all the great ideas and questions. Okay, and I'd be happy to, to talk to you about collaborating. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you all. Have a great thank afternoon. You.